One of the things the center does is uh, we've helped to generate a UC-wide survey, and uh, it's uh, uh, of all undergraduate students, and it's a collaboration with many other important people. And uh, one of the things it tells us is that we really have to think sometimes about uh, different notions of globalism. Uh, so for example, uh, this uh, survey showed that throughout the UC system, uh, some 54% of the undergraduate class has at least one parent uh, who is an immigrant. And uh, if you look at uh, Berkeley, the rate is around 64 percent. So uh, while we don't have a lot of uh, non-U.S. Uh, citizens uh, or non-nationals uh, in the UC system, we do have a very high rate of, of immigrant uh, groups or people with immigrant backgrounds. So it's changing notions of what is globalism, globalism, and um, keep that in mind. We'll see how that changes. California is unique in some ways. But um, another thing I wanted just to add is that uh, Tony Blair uh, kind of predicted the future of higher ed by saying uh, that his main policies were to be education, education, and education. That was going to be his national policy framework. Now, I want for the, those who don't know this, there's somebody else who said that, and that was around 1907, and it was uh, Andrew Carnegie. He said education, 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 which in, a f in another way of saying is growth, growth, growth. There will be this constant, or there has been this constant pressure to grow, to ex expand access. I'm not sure where the limit is on that. We don't know, there's sometimes debates about it, but it's a, a major, a major uh, thing. But to accommodate growth, how do we do this? How, how is it done? Uh, and this relates to our, our final uh, panel. Uh, can, we do it, uh, can we do more with less? Or do we uh, do more with a bit more and some greater efficiencies? Or can we do, it, do more uh, with much more <laughs> in resources? I think everybody says, oh, forget that. We're somewhere on stage one doing more with less, and we've been at that for quite some time, I think, in lots of parts of the world, uh, in the US, for example. So uh, how is that going to move? Now, our last session here, uh, it has this kind of uh, title that I think maybe we should have had a, a little more creativity, uh, worldwide structure. But I think what we're trying to talk about is how will things change over time, both at a kind of, well, at these different levels. One is a kind of a supranational level. Another is a nation and nation state level, regional level, and then institutions themselves. And there are other layers in there, but it's the structural kind of approaches and what's happening in the world. And we have a really uh, uh, esteemed group here to add comments. I'm really pleased that we were able to attract them and, and have them come. And I'm going to uh, introduce them in alphabetical order. But one is uh, Phil Altback, who is the uh, J. Donald Monan uh, professor of higher education and director of the Center for International Higher Education in the Lynch School of Education at Boston College and Phil's a very well-known uh, high-profile scholar on globalization and changes uh, internationally. Um, then our, uh, our next on the list is Bob Birdall, who uh, I think most of you know quite well. Uh, he is currently the president of the uh, Association of American Universities. Uh, since uh, 2006, and before that, Bob um, was the chancellor here at, uh, at uh, Berkeley, and before that, President 
uh, at the uh, University of Texas at Austin, and there are many other things that he's <laughs> done. So we're really pleased that uh, Bob has come back and he's had a, a link with the center over time, and we want to maintain that and keep that going, of course. Uh, then uh, the next uh, person on the list is uh, Wilhelm Kruhl, who we're, again, very uh, thankful that he would make the trip here to Berkeley, and uh, Wilhelm is the uh, uh, Secretary General of the Volkswagen Foundation, uh, based in Hanover, Germany, and he is currently the Chairman of the European Foundation Center and a member of the Advisory Board of the German uh, Bundeswehrband Deutschen Stif Stiftungen. Did I get close? I, I'm sorry, my German is very bad. I took French, and, and I was very bad at that, too. So, uh, uh, Then finally, we have Moraik van der Ven, uh, and uh, Marijk has been a visiting scholar at the center and is uh, well known internationally. Uh, she holds the uh, professoral, professoral chair at the Center for Higher Education Policy Studies, CHEPS, which is one of the leading uh, international centers uh, uh, focused on higher ed at the University of Twente. And uh, she has various other titles, but I want to say that she is also uh, very linked into the uh, OECD and uh, uh, is directing various programs there and is really one of the great uh, uh, thinkers about globalization. And there are just uh, numerous papers that she has done that are almost required reading if you're really going to try to understand these issues in some form. So with that, uh, I think what we'll do is we will go in the order uh, that is listed, and that begins with Bob Birdall. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, let me just begin with a kind of point of, of personal privilege. Uh, by saying how pleased I am, first of all, to be back and associated with this center. Um, I do remember in the second year of, of being chancellor here when uh, Arnie Lyman died or was dying, and the center had had a struggle for some time in, in having sustained substantial budget cuts in the 1990s. Uh, and it actually was uh, a, a call from David Gardner and, uh, and Dick Atkinson together. And Judd, you must remember this. You were uh, very much involved in it at the, at the office of the president uh, that argued for uh, sustaining the funding uh, for the center. And Dick Atkinson added to the budget uh, directly for the center. And, and so that the, the, the survival, maybe not the survival of the center wasn't at stake, but certainly the, the base for its, uh, I think, current uh, successful leadership under Judd with the very, very good people he's got working for him dates back to uh, that intervention by both David Gardner, who was then at the Hewlett Foundation, and, and Dick Atkinson, who was in, in the office of the president. Uh, so I, I'm very pleased to to be here uh, and, and to be associated uh, with this event. We're talking here today about what the impact of globalization will be on the future of structures of universities, and I'm a historian, so I'm much more comfortable talking about the past than about the future. Um, but uh, the question of will there be commonalities, uh, to what degrees will the competition uh, bring about a convergence of institutions and so forth, I think is an important one. Um, the comments that I would make here follow very closely on those that were made by Alison Bernstein this morning uh, about globalization. I think we all recognize that the, the particular national structures, the particular national traditions and cultures in which uh, universities are embedded, shape the governance, it shapes the relationship to, uh, to the government, it shapes the, it shapes the tradition of entrepreneurship and the various sources of funding. Uh, one can see that clearly, it seems to me, for example, in the fact that public universities in the United States have engaged in, in uh, private fundraising. That has been adopted uh, 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 and, and modeled in, in Britain to some extent. Uh, and yet it does depend on traditions of philanthropy. It depends upon tax structures of, of, of particular societies. So it isn't easy to superimpose structures of funding or governance from one set of uh, experiences onto another. 
Um, and it does depend on the traditions. If I, the, the area that I'm most familiar with is Germany. Uh, there isn't a tradition of alumni identity with institutions in a place like Germany, uh, which is really a, an essential ingredient if you're going to develop uh, fundraising. And so uh, those traditions matter a great deal. And they do argue that there will be always uh, substantial differences among institutions. On the other hand, uh, I would submit the perhaps cynical hypothesis that university structures respond more quickly to economic imperatives and opportunities than to changing structures of knowledge. And it may be those changing uh, economic imperatives uh, that are encapsulated in the phrase globalization that will bring a much larger convergence than anything that we have seen uh, before. And I, I, I think that there in the, much of the discussion, and indeed much of the discussion that we've had in the last three days here, has sort of given globalization a rather benign quality. Uh, I think Michael Shattuck pointed to some of the, uh, I think, uh, uh, exceptions to that, and certainly Alison Bernstein this morning warned us, I think, of some of the consequences of this. But I, I would submit that it is not entirely benign. It is not something that is globalization. It's not something that is value-free. Uh, it, um, it, it represents the emergence of a global a worldwide market for labor, for capital, uh, and for goods. It is dependent upon instant communication, which affects markets and the capacity of nation states uh, to limit access to information and, uh, and to control markets for labor or other things within their boundaries. Um, it represents the end of a what had been for the last half of the 20th century, uh, a bipolar economic structure in the world with the world divided between uh, socialist and capitalist, and it represents in that the triumph of the capitalist market system and the ascendancy thereby of a neoliberal economic ideology uh, to the point that it is really impossible for most of us to imagine, for anyone for that matter, to imagine another structure uh, for the economy uh, of the world other than one that is market driven and market dominated. And insofar as that brings with it the, uh, the emergence of transnational entities and transnational corporations, and indeed limits on the power of the nation state, um, it seems to me that, that, um, that globalization uh, is not at all value free in that, in that sense. And to a large extent, it is marked and has been marked uh, by a decline in the regard for and investment in public goods. Uh, and it has seen the market as the most efficient arbiter uh, and the most dif efficient distributor of, of, uh, of goods uh, that there is. And, uh, and that has, I think, profound consequences ultimately for universities, and we've talked a good deal about those consequences, and I think it does drive them very much into both a degree of competition but also a commonality uh, of structures uh, that, that we have, uh, have, have talked about. Uh, the second thing that I think accompanies that is the issue of the democratization of higher education or massification, to use the phrase that Allison used this morning. Um, and Sheldon uh, uh, talked at length about the stresses that that democratization has caused in terms of access and the distribution of the goods that education um, brings with it. Um, I would, and I submit that, that the uh, development of mass education uh, 
a mass higher education, is also producing very much the same phenomenon that, uh, that we have seen with the, uh, with, with the successful uh, uh, mass education at the secondary level. That is, as universities, when universities were educating 15, 20 percent, uh, the quality of the secondary education mattered somewhat less because it was a self-selection process. Now, the quality of the secondary education matters a great deal if you're educating 50 to 60 percent. And we did not have a good means with very differentiated quality of high schools in this country uh, to decide who uh, merited an education. And even though it wasn't initially adopted for this purpose, the SAT became the means by which standardized testing uh, equalized, as it were, the playing field or, or defined who, who merited education. We see that same call now at the post-secondary level, the call for some kind of quality assessment, outcome measures, uh, this is very evident in the Spellings Commission, and it reflects as well uh, something of the commodification of, 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 of higher education. If you look at the Spellings Commission carefully, it really calls for, and Margaret Spellings virtually said this. She said, uh, I ha can find much more information about a car that I'm going to buy than I can about a college that I'm going to send my daughter to, and it was one of the impelling factors. Well, leaving aside the fact that, that perhaps it is more difficult to describe uh, a, a university education than it is the benefit of a car uh, or the, the attributes of a car, uh, there was a good deal more information available than she gave credit for the web and for everything else. But what the Spellings Commission ultimately calls for is a kind of consumer report on, uh, on, on, on universities, and that consumer report does, it seems to me, point to the whole notion of students as consumers, uh, of education as a commodity, and therefore something that can easily be measured so the consumer can decide whether or not he or she is getting a good deal if they happen to purchase this uh, or, or that uh, education. And then, Corporations uh, are seen as the consumers, uh, ultimately, of the students. This is a part, it seems to me, of the entire um, process of, of globalization and the triumph of a particular view uh, of the world um, that it represents. Um, what does this mean, ultimately, for, for universities as we are caught up in this international market, it does seem to me clearly that it will drive us toward more standardization. Uh, I, I think it will drive us uh, uh, toward uh, the uh, measurement of, of, of universities. It will drive us toward probably, as it has, and we saw that in the last session, an increasing number of for-profit institutions that are targeted at uh, at, at training for particular kinds of capacities uh, in this economic framework. Um, that doesn't mean that, that the, um, the kind of universities that most of us have been at are going to disappear. Um, but it does mean that there will be a competition, not just for the very best, but there may also be a kind of Gresham's Law that can set in if we're not very careful about this process and that it, would, it could very easily devalue the kind of things that, that uh, those of us who've been associated with uh, research universities who are uh, concerned uh, about uh, the continuation of those research universities. The University of Illinois, for example, just this spring announced that it's going to offer degree programs uh, in online uh, with part-time faculty, non-tenure track faculty, and um, that it will create basically a virtual university with part-time faculty. Well, that's fine, except that if that were the direction that all universities go, um, who, who creates the knowledge? And so I, I, it does seem to me that, that we have in this restructuring uh, 
a lot of things to be concerned about and to watch for as we go forward. And with that, I'll simply stop. Mike. Thank you, John. Um, let me first take the occasion to congratulate the Centre with its 50th anniversary. Um, on behalf of um, the two organisations that I represent today, first of all, on behalf of CHEPS, the Centre for Higher Education Policy Studies in the Netherlands, um, I think that in our 23 years of existence, there have been numerous and very fruitful contacts with the Centre. Um, I reckon that all four CHEPS professors have been here for longer or shorter periods, Guy Neve, uh, Frans van Vught, Jürgen Enders and myself. And as I said, it has been greatly beneficial. Um, also on behalf of the OECD, I'm, I'm um, related to the um, higher education program of the OECD and looking at sort of your current research agenda as described in the last page of the program there, striking similarities with what um, the OECD regards to be important questions in higher education. Um, and the OECD then, that means uh, basically the, um, the governments of the OECD countries. Uh, last June we had for the first time in Athens um, a meeting of education ministers uh, entirely devoted to higher education. Uh, including the Minister, the Secretary of Education, uh, Margaret Spellings, that Robert just was referring to. Um, and from, from that meeting um, also came questions that relate very much to the discussions here and um, as seen to be um, imminent for the further agenda. Um, one of them, indeed, is globalization and the role of higher education institutions in that globalizing world. Um, I'll present a few comments on that to you and I think it will require you to shift perspective from time to time in following me throughout the comments and I think that that is what it takes indeed. Understanding globalization requires to shift perspective. I mean that things that are taken for granted or very obvious within a national context or in this, um, in this uh, place of the world, probably in a state context, can be much less obvious in a global context. And I think the first one, and, and that is also the first comment I want to make, is the point of mission and diversity and to some extent stratification in the higher education landscape. Especially in the US, diversity within the higher education landscape, I mean in terms of institutional mission and type, is well understood, also well understood as a great uh, feature of the US higher education sector success, but that is not the case everywhere. Um, Coming from that, the division of labor, if you want, between different types of institutions, um, and a certain degree of stratification in that is also something which is much less obvious in a more global context and even in Europe. Within countries, certainly within Europe as a whole, those, uh, those things are much well less well developed and will take a lot of persuasion to, uh, to be developed further. Um, an example in cases, for instance, Germany, probably my neighbor is going to say more of it, um, a country which is actively seeking at this moment to create a more diverse higher education landscape in order to be more globally competitive. Um, the OECD has developed for the ministerial meeting last year a set of um, scenarios on the future of higher education which differentiate um, along two main dimensions, one being from entirely international or global probably to, to national or even local, and the other one from totally being market driven as a system to very state controlled. And you can imagine how different these um, four typical scenarios would look. Um, I would like to take it however from one similarity that almost runs across all four scenarios and that is that, um, that they all indicate a trend towards more specialization and concentration in the research function. 
of the university. And that coming from that almost all indicate increasing institutional diversity, some institutions being responsible for that and others less so and probably more for other missions. This leads to questions about, as I said, the division of labor between institutions of various types, again something which is quite well defined here. But in a global context, the question is, for instance, whether such a division of labor should primarily be defined within countries or probably between countries or, as in the case of Europe, at a regional level. In the latter case, if it would be between countries or at a supranational level, the next question would be whether such an international division of labor would be competition-driven or market-driven um, or whether it would be cooperation-driven and based on intergovernmental understanding, which is mainly the road that the European Union is taking at the moment. Um, a competition-driven approach um, is not uh, totally out of the hands of governments, but could or would be probably more driven by, for instance, free trade agreements that they would sign. In the global context, um, the question is then how a balanced international division of labor can be achieved and how individual countries can balance, will balance global competitiveness with national priorities. And these national priorities do include issues of language and culture. And it may be a very efficient option to think, why not locate all the research intensive universities in the Northern Hemisphere or in the particular parts of the US or in Northwestern Europe, but what does it imply for a country if it doesn't have research intensive universities anymore for issues, as I said, related to language and culture? Countries, I think, have governments also at, at supranational level have two major strategic options for stimulating global competitiveness, and that is stimulating competitiveness in the country um, on the one hand and stimulating cooperation on the other. And governments have to consider what's the best way to make the national higher education system more globally competitive. Is that national cooperation or competition or international cooperation or competition or more likely a mix of these four options? In Europe, we see at the moment a complex mix of these four options, which in any case make the operational environment for higher education institutions probably more, more opportunity rich, but also far more complex. At the same time, governments themselves work in the context of wider multilateral agreements that are designed to provide frameworks for, on the one hand, for instance, competition, I refer to GATS, and on the other hand, for instance, cooperation, most of the EU programs. I think, and I'm certainly not the only one, that in this global context, one-sided competitive models will enhance vertical differentiation by building strength in certain institutions or areas by weakening others and may indeed lead to um, a lack of diversity. Simplistic market type strategies would also raise concern as higher education institutions may be rather driven by competition for institutional reputation, what Frans von Furcht has called the reputation race, which is indeed a global phenomenon rather by that than for competition for consumer needs, in this case, students' needs. Global competition on the basis of research performance only will consequent, with consequent institutional hierarchies and social stratification of student body can also exacerbate demand for high quality scientific labor with likely effects on mobility, I mean brain drain and price. Um, again, I think we need approaches that stimulate diversity of mission within coherent systems. And again, this is very well conceived, for instance, the state of California, probably at federal level, 
Um, but at a global level, that is much less obvious and where is the system? Enhanced uh, effects in this area, I think, are fueled by the emergence of global rankings and it struck me that in the last two days and also today, we have heard very little about global rankings. Whereas I've been attending a range of conferences <laughs> across Europe and the Asia Pacific over the last months and years that were very concerned about global rankings. So I referred to the Jiao Tong ranking and the Times Higher Education Supplement ranking and probably some others, but those are the two main ones. I think it is because the US, first of all, is used to rankings nationally and second because it's on top of everything. So it doesn't have to be concerned, but believe me, the rest of the world is nervous about it. Um, I want to say a few words about that <laughs> um, because I'm trying to, to look at this global picture and not, not just at the US picture. Um, the problem, I think, and it's widely acknowledged by experts, is that these global university rankings encourage that reputation race even more and the resulting vertical differentiation. But as it is so much biased towards research, this is the case without necessarily ensuring better institutional adjustment to student demand or improvement of educational programs, i.e. the teaching function. A common problem with these rankings is that they evaluate universities as a whole with a major bias, bias to research performance, a major bias to natural and medical services and towards English language fields and have indeed very little focus on teaching and learning or on measures of the value added during the education process. We think there are much better and sensible approaches to ranking, one of which is being developed in Germany by the Center for Hochschulentwicklung, the Center for Higher Education Development, and efforts in which my center is underway are being undertaken to extend that to a European system. Um, and the, the virtue of that approach is that it tries to overcome all the deficiencies of the models that I just um, mentioned. A very small comment on the role of um, beyond state organizations in, in the next phase of globalization. I think it's something that is very difficult to predict. Predict what will be the role of, of nation states, of regional and international organizations and multilateral frameworks and agreements will, will be in the next phase. Empirical evidence, we've done quite some research in this area, it seems to indicate a much slower change in the role of national governments or what was called the decrees of the nation state than sometimes predicted in globalization theory. And also that the role and impact of multilateral agreements, for instance, things like GATS, may be weaker than expected so far. And probably we could raised the question whether such agreements as GATS or the Bologna process for that matter were perhaps too optimistically based on typical 1990 versions of global social engineering aimed at unifications of systems and that we will learn in the next phase of globalization that we will have to accept diversity much more as a basis. Finally, I'd like to turn to the question that Narcissus Matos left us with last night when he, on his last slide, asked the question, do you believe that you and your colleagues in the South are in the same boat? Or in other words, does globalization provide us with a, a truly common framework? I think there is a necessity to address the imbalances resulting from globalization, and that it requires universities in OECD countries to consider to broaden their missions in internationalization. I think it is not sustainable if institutions only respond to the profitable side of globalization. I mean by using international options only to add opportunity, income, and or human resources to their own institutional or national basis. 
In my view, they will also have to be responsive to the more difficult sides of globalization. For instance, problems that exist between and within countries related to immigration, to migration, and social exclusion. I think that strategies in internationalization would need to be based on a combination of economic and social responsiveness. In other words, that they would need to consider what social contract really means in a global context. And that in international action and playing field universities in OECD countries um, would search for models that help to come from unilateral brain drain to mutually beneficial brain circulation and that will enable cross-border education to be really effective for capacity building, combining trade and aid strategies, if you want. And that in national and even local actions, it's not only about the internationalization strategies. I think this means that universities have to make more efforts to enhance access for migrant and minority students. And I note what John Douglas has said, and again here you have to shift perspective. It is not at all obvious that such large proportions of undergraduate students do represent minority groups in Europe, um, in, yeah, Europe and other parts of the world. Not at all. Um, I do think we need to, to support integration of student groups with different cultural, ethnical, and religious backgrounds. And we'd have to embrace diversity as a key to success in a global knowledge society, both for the universities itself and the graduates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marike. And now, Phil. It's a huge uh, problem to speak toward the end of a conference. There are two aspects of that problem. One is some significant part of the audience is falling asleep. And the other one is my very distinguished and brilliant colleagues have said many of the things which I, had in, I have in my notes. So uh, I will be standing on the shoulders of a number of giants here and You'll have to excuse me if I say some of the same things, I think with a little bit different spin uh, than they have. My task is to focus for a few minutes on the problems, the issues relating to developing countries of the broader issues of globalization and higher education. First of all, a couple of definitions, uh, which come, of course, from which I think are generally understood by, uh, uh, by this sophisticated uh, audience, but they bear rep repeating in a maybe a little bit more a disciplined way. Globalization to me, and I think to most of us, means the broader economic, especially market-driven capitalism uh, and social trends which affect the modern world economy. These include, in addition to the broader economic system, uh, 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 the rise of the private sector, privatization of the public sector, uh, IT developments, and so on. These are essentially inevitable. They are things which we all, uh, as scholars, uh, individually, as universities, as nations, need to adjust to. There are very few ways of opting out or even significantly changing that sort of broader structural reality. They're part of the environment. What I mean by internationalization are the specific policies that governments, academic institutions, uh, departments and institutes, the Center for the Study of Higher Education here at Berkeley, we as individuals may take in our approach to the global environment. Here we can, as institutions or individuals or programs, opt out, not be involved, I think very much to our detriment if we do so. But here, here there is room for initiative, for policy, for development, for investment, <clears throat> for constructive engagement. <clears throat> That's what I mean by internationalization. And finally, another term which we haven't much used uh, here, although Allison this morning referred to McDonaldization, and this is a part of it. Uh, I, uh, um, I've used that term, I, but more broadly, uh, multinationalization. 
<clears throat> and by that I mean uh, academic and scientific programs, institutions, companies uh, that operate, that are from one country and operate in another country. McDonaldization, which is, a, which is very simply the franchising, very much McDonald uh, concept, um, uh, is just one part of this broader multinationalization trend. At various aspects of cross-border uh, higher education would fall into that framework. So these are definitions, which I think are important to sort of, sh which shape our discussion and are important to keep in mind. Global, both globalization and internationalization have within them, and this is clear from the discussion today and from uh, our general understanding as well, um, uh, c important elements of inequalities. Again, Bob Berdahl mentioned that, emphasized that, uh, Allison did, Michael Shattuck did, a number of our speakers uh, today and in the last couple of days have talked about that. I mention it here simply because so much of the discussion about internationalization in the broader higher education field uh, out there in the press and so on idealizes this concept. And I think it's very important, and as I say, you know, half a dozen speakers here have emphasized it, and I think it's important we very much uh, keep it in mind that it is um, in some ways a good idea and in some ways a very problematical uh, idea. Uh, so there are elements, important elements of inequality that I think we need to keep in mind. The next broad uh, uh, issue that uh, I, I want to mention, and again, several of our speakers have already uh, talked about it, especially uh, Sheldon in several uh, comments he made during, this, uh, during the, the several meetings, uh, is we are uh, in higher education especially influenced by history. Um, uh, uh, academic institutions and systems are perhaps more affected by historical traditions uh, and realities than uh, most other social uh, uh, institutions. And for developing countries, this history is, not, is in some ways not a friendly force. Keep in mind, please, for this discussion, that all of the world's academic institutions, so far as I know, with the exception of one, and that's the Al-Hazar Islamic University in Cairo. All the rest stem from the medieval European university tradition, be they in Lebanon, uh, in Berkeley, uh, in China, in India, wherever. They all come from that tradition. And nations uh, which uh, w either inherited these Western-oriented institutions via colonialism, or, as in the case of Japan and Thailand and Ethiopia and a few others that were not colonized, they chose to adopt a Western model when they joined the, um, uh, the, the modern academic world. And their traditional uh, intellectual institutions, generally speaking, fell by the wayside. So history is important. And by the way, a small element of that history that I won't deal with uh, here is a common language of instruction. Sheldon mentioned that also. Latin, uh, uh, in, uh, Latin was the universal language of, uh, of uh, instruction uh, in the first uh, several hundred years of universities. It was only those uh, nasty Protestants, I can say that as a professor at a Jesuit institution, uh, which um, destroyed the uh, common language uh, with, uh, after the Protestant uh, Reformation. Uh, and of course, English in some ways uh, has inherited the mantle of Latin as a, a common language, not of instruction, thank goodness, but at least, but of uh, a scientific uh, communication worldwide. Let me spend just uh, a few minutes on, on some of the sp specific ways that I think that globalization affects uh, developing countries. And I think you will see from these just sort of bullet points, which I'm just mentioning uh, here, uh, how, how globalization is very much, is, is even more of a problematic for developing countries than it is for the rest of us. Um, uh, globalization affects developing countries uh, in, in terms of language. Uh, it, it affects all of us in terms of language, but it especially affects uh, developing uh, countries. Uh, in Africa, you cannot go to university, so far as I know, in an African language, unless you consider 
uh, Arabic for Egypt and Sudan, a few others, an African language, or in South Africa, Afrikaans, an African uh, language. Uh, all the rest of Africa, uh, 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 higher education is conducted in English or French, or I think Spanish in some cases, and of course Portuguese. Um, uh, developing countries are affected by the brain drain. We, we, we generously call it brain circulation now. Uh, and I think there are many elements of truth to the fact that it is much more of a circulation than it was in generations past. The internet helps that, uh, modern uh, telecommunications uh, and modern uh, air travel and so on. There are many more possibilities for back and forth uh, communication and involvement and there's a whole literature on that. But still, uh, the, ma the majority of, uh, of uh, scholars and students uh, go from south to north and the majority do not return. Now the proportions who do return are somewhat growing and it's a complicated and interesting uh, story, uh, but from the, the two biggest sending countries in the world for decades, uh, China and India, and they keep um, uh, changing from number, from number one and number two, most of the uh, uh, graduate students uh, who go abroad from those two countries uh, have not returned over a long period of time and still do not return. And there is no, no real uh, major trend in the other direction from either country. There's a s small increased return rate, but that's, that's the point here. Uh, again, several speakers have mentioned the idea of an international uh, academic labor market, and that certainly is the case, uh, especially um, in, in, for, for universities uh, in, uh, in, the, in the United States, but it's also true for other countries. Uh, Britain worries about a minor brain drain from their universities to America and Canada, um, and it's statistically there, but the major, par the major flow of, the, of this international academic labor market, as we all know, is from developing countries to advanced uh, uh, countries from south to north. Uh, and uh, again, there is an increased link, communication, involvement, uh, back and forth, but it's still largely a loss to the developing uh, 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 countries. Um, developing countries are, are more and more tied to the international scientific community through uh, information technology and other means. And all of that is certainly a good thing on average, but keep in mind uh, that it, it may also mean uh, less scientific uh, and methodological autonomy in the country itself, uh, a diminishing of the use of uh, national languages in those countries for scientific communication at the, na at the local level within the country as well as uh, 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 internationally. Uh, and so on. Uh, developing country scholars are more and more linked to international scientific journals, many of them on the website, uh, and, and uh, are distributed electronically, uh, but this may also have negative effects for, uh, for uh, local science, and it's especially problematic, and this has been mentioned again a couple of times uh, during the last uh, several days, uh, for the humanities and social sciences. Again, the methodologies, the norms, the values, uh, of the major Western journals, of the editors of those journals, and so on, uh, who tend to live in the northern uh, countries, and especially in the US and the UK, very much dominate uh, decisions which are taken about what gets published and how it gets published. And none of these decisions take into account the, the needs, the, uh, the, the foci, the problems of uh, developing uh, uh, countries. New trends in cross-border higher education, such as branch campuses, such as the so-called McDonaldization, the franchising uh, business, uh, and so on. None of these work in the, in, uh, none, of, none of these provide, how to say it, any kind of autonomy for developing countries. Uh, they may build capacity, and one hopes that they do. They may provide needed training. They may be, as the economists would say, demand absorbing. That is, they provide access 
in countries such as Malaysia, which don't have the local uh, access readily um, uh, available, uh, but they are not designed in any way, shape, or form, with probably a few exceptions, um, uh, with the curriculum, the focus uh, of the developing countries uh, in, in mind. They are imports. They are imports from the outside. Um, and they are taken essentially whole cloth from the, uh, from the outside. You know, we don't have, um, you know, the, we don't have gunboat diplomacy in higher education. That is, you know, the Navy does not arrive uh, off the coast of Malaysia, the Australian Navy in this case, off the coast of Malaysia and say, you better accept Monash University or we will fire our guns at you. These are voluntarily uh, accepted uh, institutions, but nonetheless, uh, they are largely uh, Western uh, institutions uh, and, and, and so on. It is increasingly difficult with the emphasis that, that uh, we've discussed to some extent at these, uh, during these uh, several days uh, about uh, discussing of world-class institutions, looking at rankings and so on for developing countries to play in that league. It is simply extremely expensive uh, and very complicated to build these kinds of, um, uh, of institutions. And yet, in my view, it's very important for at least the larger of the developing and middle income countries to have institutions that play in the big leagues of science and scholarship, that can communicate, that can provide training in country, especially that can interpret science from the world scientific uh, community within a country. So it's not possible, in my view, for the larger of developing countries to, to say, okay, we're not going to be, we're not going to develop uh, research institutions in our country. They need them. Nonetheless, they are expensive and they, are, they grow more and more uh, expensive uh, to, uh, to develop. There are, of course, many variations among developing countries. Uh, the situation is much more difficult, as Narciso said last evening, uh, in Africa than it is uh, for, uh, for China. Uh, I spoke the other day about co trying to compare India and China, uh, two large, powerful countries with tremendous intellectual uh, capacity uh, internally within them, but very different so far approaches to uh, to, uh, to higher education. So there are considerable uh, differences and it's a mistake, as I am now doing, to overgeneralize about the reality. And finally, um, there are, um, we need to keep in mind old, maybe old social science ways of thinking about these issues. Centers and peripheries. We don't talk too much about that anymore, but it's very much part of the contemporary reality of higher education uh, around the world. The old idea of dependency is also very much part of this system. We don't like to think of it that way, but there it is. We need to face reality. Thank you. Wilhelm. Well, first of all, I should also like to congratulate uh, the director of the center and uh, particularly also to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in the preceding conference as well as in today's meeting. I learned a lot and I feel quite enriched by all the things we have discussed. Being now the final of the final speakers, um, I could of course uh, stick to uh, a favorite quotation from our former president, the late Johannes Rau. He once said, well, all has been said except by myself. So <laughs> I could go over it all over again, but um, given the enormous speed of change and the uncertainties and complexities involved, I feel it's probably needed to, let's say, pinpoint a few things which could even serve for further research as well as for further discussions. Uh, and one of the aspects clearly is, to me at least, um, how we deal with internationalization. Um, and there are 
a lot of different aspects to it. I'm speaking, well, more or less as the third speaker in, in this meeting from the perspective of a foundation, but of course, being a foundation, the Volkswagen Foundation that is uh, being strongly involved in supporting higher education and research, I will also try to um, involve uh, the other perspective of the higher education institutions themselves. Um, of course, for instance, also in Germany, uh, there has been quite a strong move towards teaching courses in English. But it has clearly been shown um, also by some of the technical universities that this is probably not the most viable strategy. Because if you offer courses within Germany in, let's say, rather broken English, you will be at a disadvantage. So what you have to do is to have to, first of all, recruit international faculty if you want to do that. And then you have to rethink what is actually your competitive advantage. And the competitive advantage can only be that you train bilingual people. <laughs> Uh, for instance, my foundation has now started a new initiative which is called German Plus Higher Education and Research are Multilingual in order to clearly indicate that it's probably wiser to go for a combination of various things. But then again, that requires that you also reconfigure your coursework as well as the recruitment of personnel. And, uh, well, it was already mentioned that Latin used to be such a language, um, and English probably nowadays is indeed the language for scientific publications and all the rest of it you can't do without it. Um, on the other hand, of course, we all know that within certain languages you also configure issues differently. Um, and that's why I think you can't just say, let's switch to the other side. Uh, by the way, with respect to internationalization, I'm, I've just um, written a review of a book on 150 years of um, the ETH in Zurich, the Federal Institute of Technology. And not just the ETH in Zurich, but also most of the technical universities um, around 1900 had uh, a student body composed of at least 40% foreign students. And now the new target is to come back to 20%, at least for most European universities. So we had a period of nationalizing uh, the student body as well as the teaching staff in the 50s and 1960s in particular, and that still was kept in a number of institutions well into the 1990s. But for instance, for the ETH Zurich, they reversed that trend or began to reverse that trend in the 70s and 80s and deliberately recruited as they did, by the way, in the 19th century, a lot of people from outside Switzerland. So this nationalization of teaching staff and subsequently also the student body has come to an end, but whether we reach the same degree of internationalization as we had in these institutions in the late 19th century is still an open question. I'm glad that my colleagues uh, addressed the issue of the developing countries. I was also quite impressed by the speeches yesterday evening and here again, we have to, I think, rethink what internationalization means. Uh, for instance, also my foundation has, by having had a program uh, of partnerships for some 20 years, indirectly and involuntarily contributed to the brain drain from the developing countries. Because if you do that with a two to three year project kind of grant, you almost automatically contribute to um, the um, uh, migration of some of the eminent researchers to Europe and also to the United States. We have now been uh, reconfiguring these kind of approaches um, in a new initiative, Knowledge for Tomorrow, uh, where we try to encourage people uh, not just to participate in projects which usually were defined by the European researchers, but that they already, the African researchers that is, get engaged in the agenda setting right up front. So that you start off by having them uh, already defining what the research agenda should be, and then of course also to take a much more long-term approach. So to have a rolling system of grants and providing incentives for them to actually stay, um, for most of the time at least, in their 
local um, institutions. I think that is also something which is badly needed if you want to make sure um, that in the long run these countries will also be able to profit from globalization. And I feel that there is a lot to do in that respect. Of course, um, we can observe in almost all countries that the public-private interface is changing quite rapidly. Uh, and it's not just the entrepreneurial uh, part of it, or let's say the for-profit part of it. Increasingly in Europe, we have, let's say, two different tendencies among the major foundations. Uh, some, like my own foundation and a few others, are very heavily supporting public institutions in order to, let's say, restructure them and help to uh, redevelop their management processes as well as to enhance their research performance. But more and more medium-sized to large-scale foundations also uh, set up or link up with private higher education institutions. So for instance, if you look at the German scene, the Zeit Foundation has decided to set up its own law school, the Hertie Foundation, its school of governance, uh, the Jacobs Foundation, the most recent example, bought into an international university at Bremen. So we have a clear trend towards establishing and running one's own institutions which is quite a new pattern, uh, and in particular also uh, with respect to recruiting international students. These uh, rather small-scale 1,200, 1,400 students kind of institutions have at least 40% students from outside Germany, in some cases even more than that. Um, and I think that is also something which will probably uh, be continued. Uh, for me, the most crucial question really is how should the future generation be trained? Of course, we had uh, for the past five or six years what I would call a formal process of introducing the bachelor's and master's degrees into the German system, which until then used to be the, a diploma-oriented uh, system. Uh, but let's say most of it was simply done by uh, restructuring existing coursework and uh, trying to um, define a dividing line between a bachelor's and a master's, still assuming that everyone would have to go on until the end of the master's course, which of course turns out now not to be the case. In most universities these days, roughly 60% are leaving the university after uh, the bachelor's course, which is uh, still much lower than in your country and in the UK, but uh, let's say it clearly shows that the students themselves vote with their feet and do not just wait uh, for the professors to tell them that they should go on, even like it is usually the case in chemistry, uh, a good chemist has to have a PhD, otherwise he's not a good chemist. But speaking of chemists, and I hope those in the room will forgive me, I should perhaps quote Georg Christoph Lichtenberg, who once said, and that's 200 years ago, him who only understands chemistry doesn't really understand chemistry either. So. <laughs> So the, 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 the real point here is we have, to, we have to think beyond the respective degree of specialization. It's not just that we can train, as we did in large parts of our universities at least, highly specialized people who have, let's say, a lot of knowledge and expertise about a certain uh, area, but who have neither the communicative skills nor the leadership skills to take on their future roles in society. And in this respect, I hope that, let's say, we can also join up with some American foundations to actually learn from you, maybe to a certain extent, but also to discuss what is needed in the future. And there are some examples in this country, like the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and others, who are really doing some work in this respect, and I hope that we can work from there. And um, I think the final point really is uh, for the future, how can we provide space for really original thinking? Um, I think uh, John Gage this uh, morning addressed the issue with respect to the one person that can change the agenda. Uh, nowadays, I feel it's usually a team 
but still, how can we enable these teams to actually really develop creative approaches, original approaches, and that again, in my view, takes a much longer term uh, commitment than the usual short termism in which we have fallen in most of the funding of research, and that is the usual two to three year project. In, that's more or less a rolling system where you haven't had really the opportunity to rethink and restructure what you want to do. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, just one, a couple of comments, then we'll go to the floor. And one is that um, if we're going to follow the dominant political economic paradigm, I guess we'll all be speaking Mandarin very soon. So. Uh, the other thing is that. Uh, uh, whether uh, globalization is a good idea or a bad idea, we know that much of it is inevitable in some form. And I just to return to my uh, a little original theme because I think it's something that's not quite, it's a hard thing to grasp, but it's a variable that isn't fully brought in often. Is that it's not just about marketization or stratification and all these things. It's also about growth. And growth will exaggerate whatever occurs, it's not a steady state, and we're going to see really large growth, and so this is gonna really be a major aspect of shifting the market and changing, changing things. So, now, I asked uh, 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 a few people in the audience just to say some pithy uh, comments or uh, questions, uh, knowing that the day was late, and that would be a good way to start things off. So I've asked Thorsten Nybaum, Alison Bernstein, and Ahmed Bawa if they could just successfully say a few thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thorsten. Being asked to ask a question is always tough, you know. Uh, so, and I probably will be just rambling on. But uh, primarily, I am asking Mareik for an advice. You were talking about the need for uh, diversification and differentiation. But at the same time, you said that uh, globalization will lead to increased competition. And competition does not usually create or promote diversification. On the contrary, it almost always creates standardization and ultimately trivialization. So I would like to... Uh, ask you if you have any advice how we sh can safeguard or even increase diversification and uh, differentiation uh, under this, these circumstances with increased global uh, competition. Difficult. I mean, you're right. I mean, that, that's, that's where the concern is, exactly, that you need diversity in, in functions and missions and not everybody trying to do the same thing, not within, an, not within one country, but even less on a global scale. Um, and the question, indeed, is um, how to counterbalance competition pressures that would exactly lead, you know, into that direction. Um, I can, I can give only partial answers, um, and, and those are concrete projects at, at this point indeed. What we're trying to do in Europe is first of all design something like a um, Carnegie classification of, of institutional types. We don't have such a thing and we think it's useful to do, to, to understand the existing diversity better, but also um, that's probably also where it links to the revised Carnegie classification being multidimensional. And, um, encouraging institutions to develop distinct and different profiles instead of, and, and I know the history of the, of the classification in this country that it also um, uh, was used or, or, or it uh, enhanced probably um, mission drift to some extent. Um, we think it's, it's useful to try to develop a multidimensional um, version of it in which universities can excel in different and build reputation in different um, areas than just research. That's one. That's a very weak measure, perhaps, but um, we think it's conditional. Also, for the second one, and that is ranking. I mean, really, as I said, rankings are all encouraging research 
performance in the research area and, and tell very little, especially to students, um, on, on teaching quality. Uh, as Robert said, uh, it's probably more difficult to explain than, than the quality of a car, but I don't think we should stay at that point. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, for instance, the OECD is looking into the possibility, um, and, and it's not just the OECD, it's also an initiative that, that here is under discussion in the department and uh, which is very heavily discussed uh, or well, discussed it's, it's under development in the Bologna process and that is to define learning outcomes better so that we are better able to assess quality in the teaching area as long as we're not able to assess quality in the teaching area and we are very able to assess it in a particular way in the research area that sort of biases everything and the third mission of the university, or the third mission, um, everything that is in research but more innovation oriented and knowledge transfer oriented, we should also be, you know, uh, able to assess that and reward that better, as much as lifelong learning uh, missions, but it all requires as much effort as we've put into research so far. Torsten, I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, competition automatically leads to a high degree of standardization. I could give you some examples, for instance, from the European scene currently, that this is uh, quite the contrary, uh, you see. Um, for instance, in this whole competition within Germany, um, this is not something which has a standard model of a research university as the benchmark for everyone. Rather, it works the other way around. It's what, what is currently going on is that each institution that competes for this kind of thing really has to strike a balance between the local and the global, if you like. They have to analyze their local strengths and weaknesses. They have to come up with a concept which really develops the strength further. And the objective is to reach a higher degree of global visibility. And that, if you look at the current concepts from Karlsruhe to Göttingen, for instance, uh, to Munich, that in each case leads to very, very different and not standardized approaches to how to aggregate the resources in a better way and how to structure um, the things in such a way that you end up with a much stronger uh, place. For instance, for Göttingen, you see, the crucial thing is that they now well, they have been trying to do that for some years now, and they have had some successes, but this initiative is now actually stimulating all of the Max Planck directors and the other non-university institutions to join forces with the leadership of the university in establishing joint research schools, by the way, attracting international students in large numbers. Of course, they have flagships like the Nobel Prize winner, Irving Nea, and others now being part of the business, which was not the case some 10 years ago. So this is, I think, one response to these challenges, and I'm sure that the European Research Council, despite the fact that it, there's currently a strong danger that it will be bureaucratized, nevertheless, it will lead to much more competition um, from the various uh, strong departments within the universities in order to show that they can actually compete at that level. And therefore, I don't think that that is uh, what leads to standardization. Uh, the other things, clearly, um, the, the Bologna process and others have uh, uh, led to a, what I would call a formal standardization. Underneath that, there's also an enormous degree of diversity. We have time. We can give a rebuttal on that. But uh, Alison, please. And then Ahmad, if we could go to those two I've, questions in a row. I've been and we'll very um, reassured by this last panel because uh, I think that this panel is... Uh, telling us two things. Uh, I'm not sure I agree that uh, all globalization is inevitable, as, as Phil Alpak said, but certainly I believe that there are ways to ameliorate the most negative aspects of globalization as it relates to the perspective of the global south. And so I'd like each uh, panelist briefly to comment on whether or not it is possible to create the kind of social contract that you've mentioned uh, between institutions or between faculty that are a set of best principles. Uh, for example, with regard to the brain drain, are there practices that can help 
to reverse or at least create counter trends. With regard to questions of uh, research capacity building, uh, can there be ways that uh, institutions in the global north, let's say in Europe and the United States, partner with institutions in the global south where there is a sunset clause that in fact the U.S. institutions bow out once the capacity has been built locally or regionally or nationally. So I guess my question is, could there be a kind of Sullivan principles? And for those of you who are not as familiar as Ahmed Bawa is with uh, South African history, you know when American companies refused to leave South Africa, uh, for the most part, there were a set of principles that were promulgated to say if you're going to stay there, you have to you have to behave in a certain kind of way. And I wonder if higher education is capable, American higher education, let's start with that, mm -hmm. is capable of a kind of set of Sullivan principles that govern how we partner with global institutions in the South. Thank you. Could we just uh, have Ahmad Bawa? Oh, great. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I've just finished reading uh, Amacha Sen's uh, The Argumentative Indian. And, uh, you know, one of the things that really startles you in this book is this early flow of uh, scholars you know, between India and China and uh, the Arab world and China. And, um, and uh, it becomes quite clear you know, from this book like, just how important uh, these uh, connections between these centers of learning right, were in those early years. Like, right? And of course, universities have always been bridges right, across, uh, you know, across, across big divides. Right? Um, now, the reason I say this is because, you know, just uh, this last three days, in fact, has just re-amplified for me the extent to which the discourse on the impact of globalization on higher education is dominated by the knowledge economy, right, and the dictator. In fact, you know, the higher education system is being dragged into this debate right, on what is, you know, what is, what is on the table, if you like, from the knowledge economy. Right? You know, it, uh, you know uh, Bob spoke about uh, you know, the way in which uh, knowledge structures have changed and so on. Uh, the way in which uh, dis disciplines are being reorganized and so on, uh, at universities across the world, right? It's happening everywhere. Uh, but it's really a reflection of the way in which universities are responding to the needs of the knowledge economy. Now, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, uh, the, the big issue for me is, uh, is uh, where where is the lead being given by higher education to reshaping globalization uh, towards developing kind of a global knowledge society, uh, not a global knowledge economy, just, not just an economy, but a global knowledge society. If you, you know, where is the uh, impetus? If the impetus doesn't arrive, arise in the universities, where the hell will it arise right, for this? And of course, you know, it's interesting that uh, there's, there's, there will be global kind of uh, global collaboration on the on climate change, on uh, the on the disappearance of global di uh, on biodiversity and so on. Uh, but that's only because uh, those are being recognized by the knowledge economy right, as being important too. So yeah, so my you know my a deep desire, really, is for us to begin to see higher education play a much more proactive role in, in designing that, uh, that discourse, if you like. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's have Phil and uh, Bob respond to those two, again, to begin with. Again, in, in interest of time, I just make three kind of bullet points. Uh, one is, uh, and I think this, uh, this, this panel and the discussion uh, contributes to it, is um, uh, if we can raise consciousness about the realities of these questions, it's an important uh, first, first step. And as I've said in my little presentation, so much of the discussion lacks that consciousness. So I think that's an important step. Point two, uh, yes, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in response to uh, Allison, I think um, individual arrangements between institutions, between consortia of institutions and so on can very much take in with, with goodwill, with thinking, with consciousness, uh, can take into account these issues and ameliorate them, maybe eliminate them, I sort of doubt that frankly, uh, but at least ameliorate them. So yes, there is, uh, we're not in a kind of Manichaean situation where we have no autonomy at all. My point about my definition of internationalization I think 
tries to take that in, into account. And uh, the final point is, but so much of the international initiatives that are going on at the moment, uh, the uh, much Australian policy dictated by the government to earn money in different ways from enrolling foreign students, international students in Australia, from the export of, uh, of um, uh, branch campuses overseas and so on, are not aimed in the direction at all. This is government policy. They're not aimed in the direction that we've been discussing uh, uh, here. Uh, a lot, the, the UK is a more nuanced situation as, as I understand it. Uh, and contradictory things are going on at the same, uh, at, at the same time. And that's probably true for most, uh, most, most other countries of the global north. Um, so what's happening on the ground does not conform in general to any sense of Sullivan principles or any kind of consciousness of what goes on in the broader context. There may be shining examples of goodwill and good, good programs, uh, and many of them sponsored by Ford and other uh, foundations that do understand the realities uh, do, do that, but a lot of it does not. Um, but I, I would say simply that um, I think recognizing that globalization has these very negative consequences for some elements of the world is the beginning of that wisdom. It is the consciousness issue. And I don't think that universities or, I, I don't think that is a widespread consciousness. We talk here, if you listen to the debate in Washington, for example, about visas, um, and it is uh, true uh, that this country feeds upon uh, the, the brain drain, but what the justification for uh, much of the immigration policy that's being advocated, for example, in, in the United States Senate is we need that brain, that positive brain drain to bring people into the United States because we're not training them here ourselves. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that our public policies, just as you mentioned the Australian policy, as a case in point, uh, work just in the opposite direction of what you are suggesting in terms of a global, uh, a global consciousness. Uh, I also just believe that implicit in, as I suggested, in the notion of globalization is the notion that um, market structures are the only or the, by far the most efficient means uh, of allocating goods and that that has inf infected, as it were, the whole notion of, of universities. So you get things like uh, the notion of importing students uh, in order to balance your budget. And uh, so I, I think that we have to really um, rethink this. Now it may be that something like a major worldwide crisis that global warming may represent will, uh, will stimulate degrees of cooperative thinking that nothing else has. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Marek, and then we'll have, th I've got three already on the floor, and then we'll have to uh, call one, it quits. One comment on the social contract question, um, <coughs> comment about my own country usually don't comment much on that, but in this case I will do it because as Narciso showed last night, it's one of the three main net contributors to the development of higher education in Africa. I was very pleased to see that. Um, but there has been a change, and that relates to, to Ahmed's question on how proactive universities are. The Dutch universities used to be far more proactive in their role in the South 20 years ago. That has changed immensely, I think, uh, resulting from the introduction of, of all sorts of new public management techniques in the national steering of the system, which uh, stimulated the Dutch institutions to be nationally and internationally competitive. Uh, they have figured out these strategies quite well now um, and are still interested in working in the South, provided that there are real incentives to do so. So the answer is uh, they're not so much proactive, they're reactive and responsive to governmental policies. So government, at least in the European context, matters enormously in, in this respect, I must say. Right, uh, we're going to accumulate the three questions, and please, uh, yes, you're, you're up, uh, do we have a microphone for... Um, 
My name is Jerry Gamp. I'm from the Association of American Colleges and Universities. I want to say I've learned a lot, and I think that we've got a lot of uh, information about the um, uh, analysis of the, uh, the problems and the issues of globalization. Um, my friend uh, Russ Edgerton, who used to be the president, as many of you know, of the American Association for Higher Education, used to say AAHE plays a Paul Revere role. They identifies important issues and brings people to, to say why they're important and suggests various dimensions of them. And it's like Paul Revere who said, you know, the English are coming, the English are coming, be prepared. I have a feeling now it's the Chinese are coming, the India, Indians are coming. My gosh, everybody's coming. But, and here's <laughs> the but, I don't know what to do about it. Uh, I don't, uh, it's important to have awareness. It's important to have um, um, a, a number of um, um, constituencies involved. But I've got to say, I don't trust the business people. I don't trust academic people. And that's my whole career, but I don't trust any one constituency to have the answers. I don't trust the technologists. But what I do trust is uh, a place like the center. I was at the center during the second phase that Janet Rural described. And we applied a lot of social science analyses and empiricism. That's a part of it. Um, you know, Sheldon um, and his colleagues did a lot of historical study, and that's a very important part of it as well. But it seems to me that what might be called on for the centers now would be to get these different constituencies together and think creatively, not about what is, not about what has been, but what we can do to solve these problems that uh, you all have served a Paul Revere function for us to do. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, and then it's Christine has the last word, and if make Thank it as short if you can, we're short on time. I'm Tom Leonard, I'm the university librarian here. There's a new set of data that you may not be familiar with that's emerging from the Google Book Project that speaks to this question of the forces for uniformity in higher education. Um, libraries used to think that they were building cookie cutter collections. We were kind of doing the same thing and only a few of us really had very special rare collections which we were glad to be proud of. But the uh, evidence that Google has turned up um, is as follows, that actually rarity is common, that quite modest universities have distinctive holdings that we just didn't know was so distinctive. Um, and it, if you think that the um, collections that we have in some way reflect what's taught or what people think should be in the curriculum, because after all, libraries do throw out books if they're no good at all, it suggests that you know even in a field where librarians are trained the same way and sort of think the same way, this marvelous diversity has developed which currently is a big pain for Google because it has to keep extending its reach into more and more seemingly out of the way libraries to actually capture what the academy has over the years accumulated. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, from the Center of Organization Sociology in Paris. I would like, as I have, I think, the last question to come back with, to the first one we had for this panel about specialization. And I'm not sure we can oppose specialization and diversity. I think they are both going together. It's not an either or question. And we probably will have more diversity, more differentiation, but at the same time, more standardization if you take institutions of the same category. And uh, that's so, and maybe to, because I have to be real quick, to suggest another answer to Thorsten's question, how to uh, maintain uh, diversity. Uh, I would suggest to have as many rankings as possible. The more rankings we have, the more dimensions we have to rank the institutions, the more diversity will be uh, sustained. Thank you. Thank you. You know, unfortunately, I think we're, we're, we can't afford more time. We have to move on, and it's late. Uh, thanks to the panel, and uh, thank you all for coming. And now uh, we have the director.